and let me hit the full screen here. And are you able to see my my main uh, PowerPoint? Looks good. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll get this party started here. So today we're going to talk a little bit about synthetic versus real world benchmarking and workload. We're going to talk about some pros and cons of both. I've had quite a bit experienced on both sides of the fence here, um, where David as well, where I have actually done a lot more with real world benchmarking compared to synthetic. But I'm going to go over and cover a lot of great examples for both here, and actually give you some demos on how you can actually start doing both of these as soon as you want to. So with that, it's a little bit about David. Like I uh, said, unfortunately, he's not able to join us here today. Um, so I'll try, to, I'll try to bring up some of the pain points I know that he would be bringing up if he was physically here. And then a little bit about me. Uh, one of my good friend, Andy Leonard, always puts up a good photo of his family when he goes about him about himself, and I like to do the same. I'm blessed to be a, uh, a SQL DBA, part of the SQL family, but I also have a nice, great family I love spending time with as well. So luckily I'm a father and a husband and at the same time as being a SQL family data pro. So a little bit about me. Uh, I wrote a book with a good friend of mine, Mr. MVP Tim Radney, over backups uh, a little while ago. I am certified uh, I run the High Availability Disaster Virtual Chapter just with David as well. I also run the local Austin user group here. And I also do a lot of SQL Server consulting. So if anyone ever needs help with performance tuning, troubleshooting, I'd love to talk to you to see if there's any way I can help you out. So on to the presentation. So this is our basic agenda for today. And this is what we're going to try to cover here in the next 45 to 50 minutes or so. Also, if anyone has questions while we're going through, feel free to throw them into the window and we'll try to address them here as we have some breaking points uh, throughout the presentation as well. But we're going to kind of go over showing you that everything's a system and things that you want to look through as part of your benchmarking while you're replaying a workload, whether it's a real world workload or a synthetic workload. And we'll talk a lot about both of these in a bit as well. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff you want to monitor and collect that's included in both, or maybe in one or another. For example, we'll talk a little bit about transactions per minute or orders per minute. Those go more, those are synthetic counters. Um, but at the same time, we can use all those real world counters that we love through Perfmon or weight stats, disk latency as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to include some great demos that I hope help shows everyone on the webinar today that it's not that hard to get started with workload tuning, whether it's better for you to do synthetic, real world, or maybe both. We're going to go through demos uh, showing tools on how you can do synthetic uh, workload, and then we're also going to show you the same thing with looking at your real actual data that could be captured in your system. We'll also go over about how I do analysis on this as well. So I've been doing this for many, many years in many, many different environments. And my goal here is to hopefully save some of the pain points I went with by showing you some of the lessons learned over the years as well. So at the very basic steps of benchmarking, this is what it is at the lowest scale. In fact, this is how I started doing benchmarking. Basically, someone, whether it would be a manager or someone in another department, would come up to my cubicle, tap me on my shoulder, and say, hey, things are slow now. Fix it. I'd go, well, okay. So I would start capturing some workload, whether I'd be using you know, a quick trace, now extended events, of course, Perfmon, or some third-party tool. I would start looking at data that was happening now or when the problem occurred, I'll do a real quick analysis because the person standing over my shoulder doesn't want me to come back to them in a week and say this is what we'll do. They usually wanted quick results. So I would do something. It may be good. It may be bad. I would make that change and the cycle would keep on repeating. So one of the goals at the end of this presentation, I'm going to show you a pattern that I have 
gone through over the years that really eliminates this because in reality, you want, don't want to do anything into production until you know what you're going to get before you do it. And we're going to show you how, how that can be done. So what are some of the benefits of workload replay? I mean, why would we care about this at all to start off with, and what can we gain from it? Well, as I, I just previously mentioned on the last slide, I only want to put things into production when I know it's baked and it's good and I know what we're going to get. And I've had to work in some really critical environments where they can pinpoint exactly how much money or revenue was lost per minute they were down. So because of that, I really didn't want to introduce risk into production. But at the same time, I learned there's a lot of benefits other than just mitigating your risk. And here we're going to talk about some of them in here. So for example, a hardware upgrade. If we know we're going to make a hardware upgrade, maybe we're moving from you know, older servers and we're going to move to newer ones, well, we could go through and do synthetic or real-world workload captures and benchmarking to see exactly what can happen at the same time, we can look at scalability testing through this process. So a perfect example, I previously when I was a full-time employee before I was a consultant working for myself, I worked for a big hardware seller and they sold a lot of hardware on Black Friday. So we did a lot of scalability testing to figure out, hey, when do things start to go south for us well in advance? So we knew and we were prepared and we had a good run book on here's certain things we do when we reach certain amount of metrics throughout our biggest peak load. So at the same time, I know there's still a lot of people out there doing P to V or physical to virtual migrations. And this can help you as well because before you go over to that environment, you know, and a lot of times too when people do these P to V environment changes, you tend to not get the exact same resources. So usually this is a good point where people will try to figure out, okay, how many cores do we really need? Or how much memory do we really need? And you can do a lot of testing through here to get answers to that question. And this also goes to along, along with what I would call the new P to V migrations, which could be your on-prem out to the cloud, whether you're doing Azure VMs or Azure SQL database or any of the Amazon stuff as well. You can do some of this stuff there too to kind of figure out when do you start to hit bottlenecks and when do you want to move up or move down based on the tiering that you have there. So another great place where this comes into hand is when we're starting to look at software upgrades. So this could be the actual application or this could even be SQL Server. In fact, a perfect example, if anybody wanted to do some good homework after I show you how to build and generate a synthetic workload, you could do this with HammerDB, which we're going to go through today. Do, if you do it on 2014, it's going to use the new Cardinality Estimator. And because of that, it's going to give you some different performance than if it's disabled. And so like a great homework exercise maybe if someone really wanted to look into workload replaying here is to run that synthetic workload, capture it, and then do it again and compare the results. And I'll kind of go through the whole presentation today on a lot of pieces you can use that's free to help you with that. Another thing that we're going to go ahead and take a look at here is high availability impact. So as I mentioned, I run the HADR virtual chapter with David Klee. And one thing I've experienced in my real world when I work with some forward-facing websites that moved from not using AGs to AGs is depending on your mode that you are going to use, there's going to be some impact in there. So for example, if you're doing synchronous availability groups, every time you're changing data, you got to go over to the network commit on the disks of your, your secondary and then send the acknowledgement back over. And there is, there is some, some slowness to that. So that's something that you could easily go through and benchmark and say, okay, as you're doing a proof of concept here, this is exactly how long this workload took just running locally on that box. And this is exactly what it looked like to see, well, this is what it was if we were doing asynchronous availability groups. And then once again, you can compare that on to doing synchronous. So you know up front, and you can combine some of these. So you can do this with scalability testing as well, to where with a 
synthetic workload as an example, you can generate a, as much load until you start hitting some of those bottlenecks. So you don't even have to just do one of these, you can combine a lot of these as well. So what should we baseline? That's another question that you should that a lot of people wonder when they're getting started with benchmarking, especially working with workloads. So the very first box up in the top left, we're going to have what's known as just TPM or OPM, and different tools that do synthetic benchmarking may name this a little bit different. But basically, this is a synthetic benchmark counter that's included in a lot of the synthetic benchmarking tools, and this just means how many transactions occurred per minute and how many orders were purchased in a minute. So this is by no means what we'd expect when we look inside a perf mod and we're seeing you know, batch requests per seconds or even transaction in a database. This is completely separate and it's just its own little counter and while to a DBA it may seem like it doesn't hold much value, it, it's one thing that's good to look at when you're going through and you're actually doing workload testing because you can see based on some changes you're making how that counter is changing as well. So at the same time, we're going to have a lot of the traditional stuff that we would look at inside of SQL Server whenever we are capturing workloads. For example, perfbond, we could get in and see, you know, what are our batch requests per second, how long are we staying keeping pages in memory, all of our good known SQL counters can be thrown in. At the same time, we can start looking at wait stats. So this is a perfect example of when doing some benchmark testing across doing a new HE configuration. I can start to look at some of those HADR specific weights and see exactly how often are we waiting for the actual commit to occur when we're in synchronous mode. So same thing with disk latency, right? This can be done with DMVs or with perfmon. And then the last two I mentioned here is really cool because if you haven't had a chance to look at SQL Server 2016 yet, my favorite new feature query store is going to help a lot with both of these. So the first one is kind of figure out, out okay, what are our top offenders? Because if something is changing and not going as expected, one route we can do is find the top offenders see if there's some simple bottlenecks that we can easily fix. Like for example, maybe we have an index that will help or the plan has changed because of the new version or an example, maybe Cardinality Estimator is now giving it a new plan. Things like that we can adjust to, but Query Store is gonna be very great at helping people troubleshoot this hard problem. But there's tons of different things that we can do to look at when we're baselining. These are just a couple of things that I highly recommend looking at. So what do you do with the results? Right? You've got quite a few different options here. I mean, easily you can scale up or scale out and know exactly when to do which one of these based on some of the synthetic tests that you're doing or even some of the real world tests if you have the ability to stress them as well. So you can also use this for bottleneck de detection. So also figuring out, you know, what exactly is that tipping point where certain things are going to start to go south, whether it's, you know, your network, your storage, or anything internal in the app or SQL itself. And then this can also help you a lot with your long-term projects. So when I say long-term projects, maybe you know helping balance things out through testing or doing AG implementations or anything else to where you can actually get some good results and you know exactly what is the impact or benefit you're getting from doing these before you actually do anything out there in production. All right, so now we're going to take a step back from looking at the big over head picture here. And now we're going to focus a little more deeper on synthetic workload replays. And this is where I kind of wish David was with me because he's a huge fan and has done a lot of great things with DVD Store. So DVD Store is a tool that Dell produced and even VMware, a lot of people in that space use this as their go-to tool for stressing databases that are virtualized. And it's a great tool that will allow you to stress basically any type of uh, standard relational database. It's not even SQL Server specific. You could 
do this across Oracle, MySQL, and many others. So another tool out there that a lot of people in the SQL Server community use, and I use more myself, is HammerDB. And I'm going to go through, and we're going to do a demo here to show you exactly how you can set that up and use that. But basically, what these tool, two tools do is they simulate a shopping cart environment where you basically have warehouses, you have items, you have customers, and the customers are making orders, picking items up from the warehouses, and how that whole process works. So a reason why I say this is very synthetic to you is we'll see some of the code here a little later on in the demo, but this most likely is not going to look like the code you have in your applications. So if you take anything from this presentation about synthetic workloads, I would say this. It's not your workload, but it still has value. And what this means is, right, if this workload for benchmarking purposes is select one record, insert one record, update one record, and that's pretty much all it's doing over and over again, I really don't see many clients that have that as their core functionality in their code. A lot of time there's even business logic embedded in, in the stored procedures or in the code that's hitting the database. It's very rarely that simple. That's why this is a benchmarking synthetic workload. It's something that you can easily push to where you can control what you're trying to do to find results. So it definitely has value. When I first started doing workload analysis a long time ago and I was doing this kind of work, I honestly didn't think a whole lot about synthetic workloads, but I've learned over the years that it holds a lot more value than people initially think when they get started because a perfect example, if you were doing work and you wanted to do a proof of concept for availability group and you're trying to figure out when things can go south for you in your environment, this is a real easy way to constantly adding a workload that's pounding the network in the disks that are very crucial when you're doing an availability group in, in synchronous mirroring mode. So a couple of things to think about synthetic workloads. So it's cheap and easy. I'm serious. It's very cheap and easy. I'm going to show you a demo here in a little bit that's going to show you. It, it takes a while to set up, but it's not that hard to implement. And it's pretty consistent. When I say consistent, I mean, you can kind of control, because it's doing a lot of really small, tiny things, you're going to have pretty good control over what you want to force it to do. So and it's also very easy to scale. In fact, I'm going to show you at the very end of our demo when we go over HammerDB, I'm going to show you how you can, in the test that it runs, it will automatically scale up and multiply the users that are concurrently hitting it. The one thing to take away, though, this is not your workload. So like I, I mentioned, the numbers you see here are going to be usually a lot higher than what you would see if you were replaying your own workload. And that's just because this workload is built for doing benchmark tests, where your workload is built to handle the business needs that your business has. And those two don't always match up. So with that, we'll go ahead and we'll jump out to our first demo. I'm looking out here in the questions area, and I don't think I'm seeing anything. So if, if people have some questions, feel free to throw them out there, and then I'll recheck this again when I'm done with the, the HammerDB demo. So I'm going to go ahead and end my slideshow here. And where is my – let me pull up my machine. All right, so here we have HammerDB. So when you install it, it basically it's just going to install under Program Files, which here and I'll even zoom in so we can see, so it's easier for everyone. There is a batch file, and that's because this application was ported over for Windows. So there's not an actual EXE you click on. But this batch file, I'll go ahead and load a GUI graphical interface that will make it easy for you to go through and, and run some workload. So that's where we'll start. So I'll go ahead and kick this off here. 
And so the very first thing you're going to see here is by default it's set up to run for Oracle since this is SQL family and we're going over SQL Server. Your very first thing you're going to want to do is flip this over to SQL Server. So to do this, we can just double click on SQL Server. And then here's where we can set up our benchmarking options in here. So, and as soon as we did that, you saw it flip from Oracle, or actually you saw Oracle go down and now SQL is at top. And now we can expand this. So I'm going to zoom in because the GUI is a little hard to get used to. HammerDB actually provides some good documentation PDFs on their website that walks you through these steps. So it's not that hard, and I'm going to walk through and show you everything here as well. So the very first thing we're going to have to do, and I've already pre-did this because this takes quite a bit of time, so when you are actually doing this and you're wondering, is this actually working, it just will take quite a while based on your configuration here to actually build out the database and the scripts. So what I would recommend is to actually pre-build out your database so that all the auto-growth stuff is taken care of and you got it set up the way that you would want so it can load in all the data for you. But that's basically what we would see here under schema build. And if you have that database pre-used and you've already built it, so after you're done building this, I highly encourage you to take a backup of that database that you're using because then instead of re-going through all the time it takes to do this, it's much quicker for you just to restore that database so you have that starting point. In fact, we, we do that here in our demo here. The next thing is the driver configuration. We're going to go over and configure how the driver is going to be configured so we can send some synthetic workload over. The next thing we'll do over here is actually create our users. And then lastly, I'll show you Autopilot, which is a really cool feature of this tool to where you can run a workload and then it can scale itself up and multiply the users for you. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started here with our very first thing that we're going to do. And we're going to go under Options. And then here are our options here. So a couple things that we're going to go over. First of all, for today's presentation, I'm going over this, all doing this all locally on one single box. This is by far not ideal. You really want to do this from another box because in reality, you're most likely not going to be having your app servers run on your SQL server. So same, same rules apply here, but to make the demo easier for today and us to get through a lot of stuff in an hour, we just have everything locally here. So the first thing here is how many warehouses. So this is how you kind of determine how are you going to scale the data. So inside of the schema, as I mentioned, we have all the tables for the shopping cart experience here. And the amount of data that's driven is based off of number of warehouses. And one lesson I've learned from this tool that it, it's not really to see at first glance is as you move this slider, like you see I instantly go from 1 to 33 to 64. So if you really want to start scaling this small, if you highlight, you touch just the real corner here, you will see that it went black here when I touched this. If I just click on that, it'll allow me to move one by one. So if I go back here, see I click it, it's two, three. I could do the same thing here, put it back to two. So the next thing we want to pick is how many users are we going to go through here? And for just our initial run here to keep this very small and quick so we can run through, I'll just do two here. So the other thing I recommend as you do this, so you can remember which database is built for how many warehouses and schemas, as I'm using this or creating this for the first time, I want to actually build my database out. And you're going to see I already have this here. For example, I already have a pre-built database here that's set up and I named it two data warehouse. So I know I have two data warehouses and it's built for two users to run it. So all I have to do, so I don't have to repeat this process, which is pretty timely, is just put in the actual name of it. So for example, if I went through and I tried to build, so this would be your next step if you didn't have the database and you're building it for the very first time. If I click on this, it's going to say, are we ready to create it? 
And you may be wondering, John, you already created it. Why do we want to create it? And the whole point of me showing you this is it's just going to quickly stop. And if we look at our messages in here, it's going to say it's already created for you. And even though we told it to users, you're going to see that we have three users up above. And I'll, as a DBA, I like to think, think of this as an operator going parallel in my execution plan, right? I'm going to have one extra thread process to monitor the threads that are parallel. And that's kind of very similar here to why we see three, even though we have two users. All right, so I can go ahead and kill this. But so your first time, keep in mind, that's going to take quite a while to go through and build this all out. In fact, if I just quickly show you what's included here, I can go over to our good old reports here and we can look at our, our actual tables in here so you can have somewhat of a good idea. So the stock in here, that's basically going to be a multiplier based on the data warehouses here. So you saw we had two and that's 200,000. And then, of course, here we're going to have items. And all this data is going to be different, and this is how you can scale your synthetic workload. So if we wanted to build out a really big one, you can add a whole lot of warehouses to it to reach the size of the data that you're wanting. So from here, go back over to HammerDB. So we have our database that's built, we're loaded, we're good to go. That next step is our driver script. And this is where we can set up some of our properties in here for actually doing our tests. So I'll zoom in on this so we can focus on a few things. So once again, this is where you put in your server connection. This is all the stuff that we had from our options up above for building. This is now going to be used by the driver to actually make some synthetic workload that we can run across. So for here, if you wanted to, you could put in SQL authentication. I'm just going to use Windows. I got my database that's created. So you have two types of tests that you can do out of the box here. So you can do a standard driver one, which basically would then go through how many transactions you want to run through user. Or we could just go ahead and do our time test. And here, this is where we're going to have what's known as ramp up time that we would use to get things ready. And then we're actually going to do the full workload for this amount of time. So this is where that transactions per minute and orders per minute can come in handy because in this scenario, I'm only running the test for a certain period of time. So if I made improvements, you know, like I added indexes or I changed some code or whatever that came through here, or a better example in this kind of a test would be if I added more CPUs, I made a hardware change, or if I was going through the example of benchmarking my AG configurations from seeing if the database is standalone on the instance or whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, what would happen here is based on the fastest uh, run here, or when I say fastest, the one that executes the most, you would see higher transactions per minute or orders per minute in here for that stuff. So another thing that we can go over here is what's known as keying and thinking time. And you'll see this a lot in whatever type of synthetic tool. In fact, we even have something somewhat similar to this in distributed replay when we look at that for testing your own workload. What this is really saying is how much time are we going to give in between operations to kind of simulate, you know, someone placing an order in real life. Um, so we could factor that in here as well. So for that in here, I'm just going to make this real quick. So I'm going to say we don't even want to ramp up, and I'll just let this run over for two minutes. So we got that. So the next thing is our users. So we'll zoom in here. So things we've done so far, just to kind of recap, because it may have seemed like we've done a bit. We've set up our options here for building out the schema. If this was your first time running, you would have built out your actual schema, which would have built the database we have. Next, we went through and we set up our driver options. This is where we specified what kind of synthetic test did we do. Did we want to just push out a certain amount of transaction per user, 
or did we want to focus on a certain time that's coming in? The next thing here, we run, we're going to create our actual users, and then we're actually going to run this. So once again, we have two users, but we want an extra one here because we have to have that user that's going to drive the two users that are actually doing the work concurrently. So if we wanted to use the delay time in here, we could have that delay and repeat time. And then how many times do we want to do this test? So for today, to get through things quickly here, I'm just going to do it once. The other thing we're going to add here is we can have the output so that the number, raw numbers we would see for transactions per minute and orders per minute can go out to the log here. So if you select this, one lesson learned is you just have to have that C temp folder there or it won't be able to build the log and then update it for you. So we'll go ahead and we'll add logging in there. And for this, I didn't enable it, but I would just set this down short in here. And so now I can create my users. And as part of that process here, it's going to say, hey, I've built the logging and the log file is going to be stored in the temp folder. Keep in mind that this file is going to get overwritten every time you run this. So you may want to go back in, save it as another file, or grab it, copy it, put it somewhere else. So we're good there. We haven't ran anything yet. We're just ready to run. So right now I could run this. So the one last thing I want to show you, because for today, due to the amount of time we have, we're going to really focus just on running this test here. But if you want to focus on really scaling out and throwing more additional load as you're doing tests, there's a really super cool feature in here called Autopilot. So if we look at these options, this is where you can do some pretty cool stuff. So everything we just set up, we can have this run and we can go through multiple configurations of users. So we could start this off with two, jump up to three, five, 13, you know, whatever we want here. And we could specify how much time are we going to run this test for each one of these. So that's a really cool thing that you can do when you really want to focus on testing to see when do things scale or when do they not scale to find that breaking point. But for today, we'll go ahead and we'll cancel that. We're just going to focus on our actual running here. So I could click the actual run users up here or just run down here. And this will start to run. So if you want to monitor it inside of here, we can go ahead and click on the icon here so we can start looking at our transaction counters. And then, oh, so I actually missed a step here. So let me go ahead and break this. And if you want to reuse, you have to break again. The one thing I didn't do here under driver, when I configured my options here, I didn't actually load them. So what this does is it changes the script in here for us. So we go over to users. I'm going to do the same thing over here as I had before. I'm going to go ahead and log them. I'm going to create my users. So this is going to go ahead and terminate the users that were just loaded on the driver part here. And then now we can see that I'm running here, and it should be cranking through the workload here. And this is something we can easily see, so just real basic test over here why this is running. I'm just showing you that real basic with a data warehouse of two and two users that are running concurrently, I'm spitting off, you know, that many batch requests per second while this thing is running. You can see that constantly change for us there. Same thing, you can do whatever monitoring you want, so for example, you can kick off, you know, SP who is active by Adam Mechanic. And this will show you the same thing. We've got two users concurrently running through here, and this is what's going on. So whatever tools or processes you want to use to capture, to benchmark that workload that's running, you can now do that through here. So we can see that this is running here. and should run for about two minutes or so. And of course, you could go back over here. 
Like I said, this will show you just some of the TPM, so transactions per minute on the fly. I mean, once this is done here in a few minutes, we can easily go look at the log file in here, and you're going to see it start to load. So we can see what this actually ends up looking like. So you can get a final transactions per minute or orders per minute as well. So while this is running here, do we have any questions at all? All right, I think I see one that just popped in, and feel free to add some more guys if you have them. So the question here is, does HammerDB create two distinct data warehouse databases when you enter two? I'm a little bit confused. Good, I'm glad this question came in. So when you're going through and you're configuring how many data warehouses you want to include, this isn't actually a database thing. This is more of a size of the database. So, for example, it's only going to create one single database, and you really only want to create that database once. Then you're just going to back it up so you can always restore it because what you're not seeing in today's demos, it's a big pain. It takes a while, even for really small databases, for it to go through and create everything for you. So here we can see the workload just stopped, the batch request went to zero, and you even see the TPM counter went down. So to continue answering the question here, that's where I kind of went and I showed you this usage. So this is just the ratio. Because we said two data warehouses, it really it's just creating the data inside of the database here to support that, which is basically just a tool you can use to drive and build a bigger database to get closer to simulating your real world scenario of how much data you have. So I hope that helps. Uh, let me know if that didn't help. Uh, thanks, Sadam, who asked that question. Um, and if anyone else has questions, feel, out to, feel free to throw them out there and I'll, I'll get to them for you. But yeah, it's just one single database. It's just how big is that database, which is what that data warehouse parameter is setting inside of HammerDB. So if we go back over here, and now we actually go to the temp folder. So here's where we'll see the logging of everything that occurred. And then here is kind of your, your workload counter that we're going to see in here. So this here is how many transactions per minute. And then here, obviously, is the number of orders per minute. So and if we did the autopilot where we're doing all kinds of tests, it would log all this in here. So then if you wanted to, you could parse that data and do whatever you wanted with it. But that's pretty much synthetic workload. That's the process everyone can go through to get one kicked off here. All right, so we're going to go ahead now and go back over to the PowerPoint here. So real-world benchmarking, and there's a couple different ways on how you do this. You know, you may be doing this, and a lot of people mostly focus on a single query, right? I have this pain point. This pain point is causing the, the business pain. It could be a long-running query from a KPI. It could be batch processing running or a report that's, that's going through as well. You can have multiple queries firing off. Or what we're going to focus mostly on today is what a full workload is. And a full workload, it could be different based on what your definition of it is. But what it's going to end up being is basically what you capture through, for example, a server-side trace and what you're going to replay. So this could be, for example, setting up a shopping cart if you were working for a company that had one and went through the whole process of what it took for someone to go in and create orders, as an example. There's a tons of tools out there that can be used here for doing workload replays. And there's a lot more than what's in here, but this is just what I've used throughout my career. And I've used every one of these, and I've used them for various different reasons. So SQL Server 2012, even with Developer Edition or Enterprise Edition, you have the ability to use a component called distributed replay. And this is what we're going to go over today to show you how you build your actual workloads here. So if you wanted to capture a workload out there in production and replay it, this could be a great tool for you to use. Another one that was used a lot more before distributed replay was out there, and this is a third-party paid product, um, was Benchmark. 
part factory by Quest, which obviously now is Dell. So there's tools out there that the CSS team provided that they would end up using if you reached out to them and needed help or wanted to do some stress testing. And they eventually provided that out there as open source for other people to use as well. And OStress is the component that would load that stress. So if you have a certain small process and you really, really want to hammer it where you have you know, like thousands and thousands of, of um, concurrent uses of this process and lots of users using this, it could still be a good tool for that. Another great one is SQL Query Stress by Adam Mechanic. So this is also in that scenario where it's more of you got a process that you want to invoke instead of a whole workload. But I actually use this, for example, when I was working for the hardware company and we were doing a lot of Black Friday testing, one of the things we had to test was the actual process of a new person creating the, the sessions they needed for being able to add stuff to the cart. And that was such a small process on the database side, we're actually able to use query stress for that as well. But another great thing about query stress now is automated open source. So if you wanted to, you could grab that code, you can modify it so it can have retry logic. So if you wanted to have something that was throwing a lot of load at an availability group, as an example, and you wanted to do failovers, you can add the code in there if you wanted to handle that, where synthetic tools won't handle that for you. So Load Runner is another great tool if you want to capture the whole workload of people doing stuff on the web and everything it does, it can help you with that. And of course there was Profiler, which was one of the first tools. And then another one that I, I probably see, but I love it when I see it, is when you have a custom process that actually will go through the app tier and do what you want to do and be able to stress it so you could say, hey, in this project we're going to simulate, you know, a thousand people placing orders, as example, if you were working for a company that actually was selling stuff over the web. So some pros and cons here. Um, so this is your workload. Right? That's, the, that's the biggest advantage. So you're not just working with insert one record, update one record, set stuff across, or update for one record, delete one record. This actually would involve your business logic, so you can do some actual work here. So some things about this, and we'll go into demos on how you can do distributed replay. There's more that you probably want to do to go through validate and trust. And also, distributed replay here doesn't actually scale, as in, here's this workload, now let's multiply it by X. There are some other tools that can help you do this with this real world workload, like Benchmark Factory or Load Runner. But the built-in distributed replay is really just going to simulate your current environment where you most likely have multiple web servers or multiple app servers that are sending data, sending transactions through a fire hose over to your database. So you can simulate that, we're just not going to be able to scale it out to say now take this load and multiply it by 20. So here's what distributed replay looks like. So this is just kind of take it from books online, and it's basically when things are, are, are set up for you, you have an admin console tool that you would use to communicate to what's known as the controller. So the controller will then take over your workload here and then shoot it out as if it's simulating, hey, i got a bunch of app servers. So if you're using Enterprise Edition as an example, you could spawn this off to a multiple different clients here. So this would be distributed replay clients. They're just kind of simulating, hey, I'm your app server, and now I'm sending data through a fire hose over to your target instance. So if you never worked with distributed replay, you may be wondering, okay, how do I actually use this? How do I install it? And it's actually there in the installer on 2012, 2014. Um, under the options there, so Ideally, you'd want to separate these out, right? But for the purposes of the demo, I'm doing everything on one box. Here I have my controller and client. In reality, in the real world, you're probably going to want to have separate boxes for those as well. But that's how you would install them. It's just not selected by default. So if you just went through and did the next, next, next install, um, this would automatically be included in there. You'd have to go back and re-add it. So your first step here, right, this is very, very basics of how do I just replay a workload through SQL Server's distributed replay. 
your very first thing you have to do is you have to capture a workload. So what does this mean when I say capture a workload? It means you have to be able to capture one that supports all the events that will allow you to do a replay. So I'm just showing you on the screen here what this looks like in Profiler. But I, I wouldn't be running this like this on your production servers. Um, I would use a server-side trace. So we would script this out, grab the script, be able to grab whatever process, or even better, if we have another environment that is non-production that we can dedicate for this kind of testing work, and we have a process that can generate that workload for us, like we have a custom process that can simulate pressing button Y 100,000 times at the same time, we can then capture that and constantly replay that workload without involving that team that's needed to, to get involved to actually do the manual work from the SQL side. So here you would actually get your replay that's captured. Once you have that done, your next thing that you would do is what's known as pre-processing. And here's just a real small workload similar to what we ran through HammerDB. And all this is, is basically taking that trace file that we have and converting it out so that way it is now going to be converted over so it's a distributed replay trace that a distributed replay can use to rerun it. So if you know you're going to want to do multiple tests where you're going to make some changes and rerun the workload, this is something you can do just once to convert the server-side trace over to a distributed replay trace. Once this is done, then we can just go through and do the benchmarking over there. So the next slide we have here is actually how do we run this thing? So here's just another example. And as we go through the quick demo of this, I'll, I'll show you how this will work here. But basically, once we've built our replay here, if we wanted to kick this off, all we would do is we'd pass in and say, okay, what's our target server, right? What's the fire hose going to be pointing to while it's replay? Where's the server that's going to take the workload that's being replayed? The next parameter, W, this is where you'd set up a client. So in this case, I have one client where if you wanted to, you could add commas and put multiple clients in there as well. So after that, uh, the F there is just telling you, okay, I want to just display the results every 10 seconds or so. The output will actually take an output trace. So if you're doing this for your first couple of times to set things up, that could be a good helpful thing for you because it could show you a lot of the configurations behind it. And it'll actually show you all the errors and everything that's occurring while it's replaying. Now that last parameter is just our previous step. So that's just pointing and saying, okay, where's our distributed replay workload that we want to replay? All right, and with that, we'll cut over to a quick demo over here to just kind of show you the nuts and bolts of what this looks like. So if I go ahead and end this here, and I hop over to my virtual machine, So if I was going to kick this off here, I would go over to run through my scripts here. So this is everything that's preloaded in here, and it, it's basically showing you an example of what we did here. So the very first thing you'd want to do, because by default, these services are not enabled. So if it's you want to stop it, you can do your normal net stop to turn them on. First thing I would do is you know, turn them on here. So that way they're on when I need them and off when I don't need them because there's no point in having things on if you don't need them. So what this will do is it'll actually then use some tools that are installed under the tools directory here. So if I copy and take this here and I just change my path here and I go to tools, this is where because I have my client and my controller on the same box, we're going to see them both here. So the first thing with client here, if you want to see the logging of what's going on, this will always go in here every time you restart the, the client service. So for example, the last time I ran, these are key things you want to look for whenever you start up. This is basically telling you that 
I connect into the controller and I can communicate back and forth. If you have issues with this, I have some links in the resources here that I can walk you through troubleshooting those. But this is basically what you're going to see in the log of it running. So kind of think of this as your SQL Server error log for the distributed replay client. And then lastly in here, another thing to quickly look at is we have our configuration information in here. So if I would say open with notepad, this is going to say where do our output go? So where is it going to be building out the actual distributed workload? And where am I going to save the results of a workload that runs? Then how much logging do I want to do? And of course the biggest thing is what controller am I connecting to? So if this is wrong, or the controller, for example, isn't running, you'd obviously have errors in the client. And to show you an example of what you would see in that scenario, I just have an example here where this is a nice fancy way of saying it wasn't able to connect over to the controller from the client. So if we wanted to kick this off and do the time over here, I already have our pre-processing, which really it's just as simple as I told you, as you have your trace, all it's going to do is just specify where do I create the distributed replay trace that can be re-ran. So I'll quickly go over into Management Studio here. I'm going to restore that database, and the reason why is because I want to have that starting point so my inserts and updates don't fail as I replay the workload that was captured. And then when I go back over to PowerShell, now, now I can just tell it, okay, let's go ahead and run this. And there it's going to go through the process of starting to capture this info, and then it's going to go ahead and replay it once it's going. So at the same time, while this is running, you would use whatever tools you had to benchmark to capture that info. And so with that, that's pretty pretty much it, and it'll just chunk through your workload there. So from there, I'll quickly go back over to our slides here. And so monitoring tools. There's a lot of tools you can use for monitoring. If you need free tools, so this will require you to do a lot more manual work, but it'll capture a lot of the stuff you want, you can use tools like SQL Nexus or RML Utilities, or you can use Extended Events, Perfbon, DMVs, but I strongly really encourage you to actually use third-party solutions, and I, I promise you, I do, I'm an independent consultant. I do not work for any vendor tools out there. The reason why I say this is just from my experience, the amount of time you save by having this whole collection process automated, it's a lot, you get a lot more value from using the tool than you would have lost by doing all this stuff manually yourself. So, for example, if you wanted a simple, easy as possible way to capture a workload, and workload stuff here that could be captured with SQL Nexus, and this is a free tool that you can get out on CodePlex, is this will go ahead and get you a lot of those metrics you're probably wanting, like Perfmon, um, some good DMV best practice stuff, your actual workload through traces. You can go ahead and run one of those batch files, like the detailed trace one here. And then once you get to this green air line here where it says it's actually capturing, then you can kick off that, that workload that, that you would want to capture. So that's one easy way to help you collect a lot of info that you would want if you don't have a process currently today. So once you capture it, it's basically going to put it all into an output folder for you. You can actually run the SQL Nexus tool to import this data over here. So once it's imported, now you can do some good analysis through it. And a lot of people will just use SQL Nexus, which is great if you're just looking at a single thing initially and seeing what happens. It's not so great if you want to get apples to apples comparisons with real, load, real world workloads here. So one thing a lot of people skip is the advanced part of RML here where you can actually compare to another capture. So you can run your workload once, capture it, make a small change, repeat that process, and then look at the difference between them. And so like here's a perfect example of the hammer DB and looking at some of the workload that's occurring based on the cardinality estimator and stuff that's going on here. 
So here's a good little graph output that you can see how many unique queries were fired off in your capture. What you would want to see if you're doing an apples to apples workload capture here is you want to see the same amount of batches. Right? If these numbers here aren't identical, um, you, you didn't have an apples to apples comparison. So let's tell you how many batches are firing. And in this case, I'm looking at CPU and I'm seeing that some changes made. So the benchmark is what I'm seeing from just it running normally. And then the second one is I, I take a top offender and I put in the, the, the query hint in there to use the old estimator instead of the current one as an example. And then of course, here's an example where you can also get more details on the query level itself. So for example, when you're looking at this, you really want to see down here comparisons. You want zero. This means apples to apples. It ran the same time in both tests. But that's, that's a way on how you could go through and run your workloads and at the same time compare them using free tools. Once again, there's a lot of great third-party tools like our sponsor here today, SolarWinds. I strongly recommend taking a look at DPA because it can do a lot of this stuff for you and automate the process of it being collected so you don't have to manually go through all that work. All right, so with that, here's just the basic process that I normally would do if I was doing workload tuning. And you saw me do some of these steps here throughout the demos today, but the very first thing I'll always do is back up the database out in production. And you're probably wondering, you're doing workload tuning, John. Why are we doing a backup? And the reason why is so we have that single consistent starting point in time. So when we capture a workload, it'll always be able to replay consistently. So we don't have to worry about inserts colliding with uh, keys that are out there, foreign keys, and same thing for updates and deletes. So you'd capture that workload, and then after that, I would do some analysis, hopefully with the third-party tool, if not some of the free ones there. Right? I wouldn't change anything. So the only thing I did in production really here is I did a backup. It doesn't have to be a full backup either. You just need that starting point. So it could be a differential as an example. It doesn't have to be a full big backup. You just need that starting point right before you kick off your, your workload you're capturing. And then from here, you would restore it. You would go through replaying it. We would do an analysis of it. And you're probably wondering, I already captured the workload, John. Why am I replaying this on another server just to get my starting point? And that's because the server you're using is not your production server. You're probably not having the same resources. And even if you did, you're not having the same concurrent users come in and hit it. So after that, I'll go ahead and restore. Now here I'll make some changes as small as possible so that way I can know exactly what benefit I get from replaying the workload. And then I just repeat the same steps. But that is pretty much it. So uh, thank you for everyone attending here. I'll go ahead and take a look at some questions, but I know we're right out of time here. So. What I may have to do is just put a blog post out to answer some of these, but if there's one or two that I know I could go through real quickly, I'll, I'll throw that out there. So one question is, is it possible to use a trace that we captured with Profiler with HammerDB? And that's a great question because that's actually exactly what I did in this demo just to get us a real quick example that we can iterate through within an hour. So yeah, I actually, what I did was I, I loaded a profiler trace, created my server side trace script, and then I just ran uh, HammerDB because in this demo I don't have my own workload, but in reality this is where you would use your own. All right, and with that I see some other questions, but I know we're right out of time, so what I'll do is I'll I'll go through on email, uh, my blog over at johnsterrett.com. I'll get a blog post out here that will go through some of the remainder ones if uh, one of the organizers can shoot me the list of questions. Absolutely well, John. Uh, really appreciate your time today. And everybody, thank you for joining us. And again, this uh, presentation will be posted on the virtual performance chapter um, in about a week and um, also the winner of the $100 gift card. So thanks, John. Have a great day, and everybody have a great day. Thanks. Yep. Thank you.